on 31, let's take a look at example four. I have three rational functions out here and I'm giving you the direction that says find all asymptotes. So when I say find all, you can find me vertical, horizontal, or slant. And I put these on an or because you'll either have a horizontal asymptote or you'll have a slant, or again, or potentially arrows, but you will never have both. So there will be no time where you give me an answer and you say, I have a slant asymptote and I have a horizontal asymptote. That won't happen. So just be on the lookout or be aware of that. All right, now before I do anything, before you start any problem, figure out the domain. You, you need to address the domain first before you start any of these problems. So if I want to look at the domain, I'm going to set each of my denominators to zero. So I'm going to set x squared minus x minus 6 equal to zero. I'm going to set x plus 1 equal to zero. Oops, zero. And then I'm going to set x minus 1 equal to zero. So we've done this one already, but I'll, I'll redo it. I'm going to factor this. I'm going to get 3 and negative 2. Over here I'm going to get negative 1 and over here I'm going to get 1. So let me identify my domain first. So my domain in this case is negative infinity to negative 2, negative 2 to 3, and then 3 to infinity. My domain here, let me give myself a little separating squiggles, my domain here is negative infinity to negative 1 and then negative 1 to infinity. And last but not least over here, we've got my domain is negative infinity to 1 and then 1 to infinity. All right, I, you should always start with your domain. You want to know what you're working with in terms of your domain because these numbers here, 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 1, those are possibly going to be vertical asymptotes. All right, anything that gets booted from your domain will either become a vertical asymptote or a whole. I'm going to save the whole conversation for something a little later. We will get to that. We're not there yet. But I just want you to hear anything you boot from your domain is potentially a vertical asymptote. And then we're going to have to look at the ratio of the lead terms to determine if we have a horizontal or slant asymptote. All right, so let's take a look. If we remember from that giant trait table, let's talk about vertical asymptotes again. When you're on the column, oops, excuse me. I, Moved that, let me move that back into position. All right, that looks pretty good. Move it just a bit over there, sorry about that. All right, when you're talking about vertical asymptotes on a rational function, right? So we've got rational function, I'm gonna scooch all the way down to where it says vertical asymptote. You wanna look for x values that zero out only your denominator, and if we find those, we're not guaranteed, but if we have them, we're going to write our vertical asymptote up in the form x equals a number. So let's see if we have any vertical asymptotes. All right, so I've got my domain. Let's see if I can get another trait. Let's see if we can get our vertical asymptotes. Okay. All right, so here we go. If I have a vertical asymptote, that means I have an x value that zeroes out only my denominator. Let's think about three. We know three zeroes out the denominator. Three does not zero out the numerator, so I do have a vertical asymptote at x equals three. Now for negative two here, all right, negative two, I know it zeroes out my denominator. That's how I found it. Negative two does not zero out my numerator, so I also have another vertical asymptote at x equaling negative two. And I'm writing these up in the correct form. All right, over here, negative 1. It zeroed out my denominator. That was how I found it. If I plug negative 1 into my numerator, it's not going to zero out. I'd actually get a negative 6 up here. So I do have a vertical asymptote at x equaling negative 1. All right, 1 zeroes out my denominator. If I plug 1 into the numerator, I'm actually going to get 2, which is not 0. So I do have another vertical asymptote. All right, so I've identified all of those. I've got my VAs. Now we need to talk about end behavior, right? Specifically, do I have horizontal or slant asymptotes or potentially arrows? Now to do that, I'm gonna scooch this up just a bit so I have more room. All right, so let me go ahead and start talking about end behavior. So this is the general category of end behavior. 
All right, so let's see what we're working with here. If you remember from example three, when it comes to end behavior, you've got to figure out what the degree in your numerator is and what the degree in your denominator is and then figure out which of these three cases it falls into. So let me just take a look here and do some scratch work. So I think here the degree in my numerator is one, the degree in my denominator is two. Here I have the degree in my numerator is one, right? This is x to the first power. And the degree in my denominator is also one. Um, here I have the degree in my numerator is two and the degree in my denominator is one. Okay, so with that, let's see what kind of case we're dealing with. So for A, degree in the numerator is one, degree in the denominator is two. Okay, so when the degree in the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, I have a horizontal asymptote at y equaling zero. All right, was my degree in my numerator less than denominator? It was. So right away I know my horizontal asymptote. It's the line y is equal to zero. So here, for my end behavior, I have a horizontal asymptote at y equaling zero. And just so you know why, it's because the degree in your numerator was strictly less than the degree in your denominator, okay? All right, so let's take a look here. I, I see that the degree in my numerator and denominator are equal to each other. So let's see what case we're working with there. If the degree in my numerator and denominator are equal to each other, I'm still going to have a horizontal asymptote, but this time it won't be the line y equals zero. I have to find the ratio of the leading coefficients. All right, so I know I'm still gonna have a horizontal asymptote. It's gonna be y equaling a number but I need to take a look at the ratio of the lead coefficients. Well, here are the lead terms, 4x over x, right? If I take a look at the lead coefficients, 4 divided by 1 is 4, and that would be my horizontal asymptote, all right? So this happened because the degree in our numerator was equal to the degree in our denominator, okay? All right. So moving from there, I have the degree in my numerator is two and the degree in my denominator is one. All right, so let's take a look at what we're working with. All right, so the degree in my numerator wasn't less than the denominator because two is not less than one. It was also not equal because two is not equal to one. The degree of my numerator is greater than the degree of my, of my denominator by one. That's true. All right, I had the degree in the numerator is two, the degree in the denominator was one, so this was one higher. If that's the case, I won't have a horizontal asymptote, I'm going to have this slant asymptote. I need the equation y equals mx plus b, and I'm gonna use long division. All right, and I mentioned back in section 5.4, I really only use long division for one occasion. This is the occasion to find slant asymptotes. All right, so let's use polynomial long division. I know I'm gonna have a slant asymptote. It's gonna be of the form y equals mx plus b. And this is because the degree in our numerator is exactly one more than the degree in our denominator, okay? Now, I'm gonna take this, this expression and let's divide it. So I'm gonna go x minus one into x squared plus x. I'm gonna scooch this down so you can see my work and then I'll come back in here and I'll fill this out. All right, so let's move this up. I think we'll be able to see it at that point. It's all lead terms, right? That's all we ever care about when we're doing long division. So what do I need to multiply x by to get to x squared? Well, that would be x. x multiplied to this binomial will be x squared minus x. I will subtract that binomial. These will cancel by design. This will be 2x. There's nothing to bring down. x times 2x, or what do I need to multiply x by to get to 2x? I only need the two. And you could multiply all of this out. You could sit here and say this is 2x minus two, subtract it, these cancel, I have a remainder of two. None of that matters. Once you get mx plus b, you're done. So there's my slant asymptote, mx plus b, where my slope is one and my y-intercept is two. Okay, 
So now let me scooch this all back down. And then let's take a look at these graphs on our calculators because I want you to see this algebra lining up with your graph because ultimately we're gonna want you to graph these things. So let's take a look at this first one. All right, again, I'm gonna protect everything with parentheses. All right, let me get rid of this. Let me hit zoom six. All right. So we can see there is a vertical asymptote here at x equaling negative three, right? And then there's another one here at x equaling two. So my algebra is lining up with what I see on my graph. Now, my horizontal asymptote is y equals zero because y equals zero is the x-axis. Take a look, as I move to the right, you see my function getting closer and closer to the x-axis. And as I move left, because this is left end behavior, again, end behavior, ends at the x-axis, as I move left, my y values are getting closer to the x-axis. So algebra matching up with graph. All right, let's try it for our second function. Let's try 4x plus 2 over, excuse me, 4x minus 2 and x plus 1. All right, so I'm going to hit zoom 6 here. I should expect to see a vertical asymptote at negative 1. I do. I see a basically a vertical line that this, this function did not cross over. And I do see a horizontal line at y equaling four. If you're unsure, you can go put four into y sub two, and you can see that four just cutting across that graph. All right, now let's take a look at this third function. Let me clear this out. Let's do x squared plus x, and then divide it by x minus one. All right, I'm gonna hit zoom six. I should see a vertical asymptote at x equaling one, and I do. And do you see this slant asymptote here? Do you see that there's now a horizontal, not a horizontal, a slanted line that acts as a boundary, and what is that slant? Well, let's draw it, it's x plus two. This is gonna get pretty jammed up, so I'm gonna make it a little thicker when I graph it. And you can see that boundary line cutting that graph right in half. All right, so we've got our looks at horizontal asymptotes, slant asymptotes, and vertical asymptotes. I'm gonna summarize it in a little bit, all right? And we're gonna take a look at two of your basic functions, and then we're gonna start graphing, all right? So hold tight for the summary and your two basic functions, and then get ready. We're gonna graph about four of these bad boys together. I'll see you in a bit, bye. Hey, Math31, in a, in a couple of examples, or really in the next example, we're gonna start graphing these rational functions. And finding traits of rational functions can prove to be particularly tricky. So I wanna give you just some techniques, some guidelines for doing this. We've discussed all of these already, but I wanted to summarize it on one page. So before you do anything, always find your domain, all right? Any x values that are booted from the domain will either become vertical asymptotes or holes. And I have not talked to you about how to find holes yet. That is coming, I promise, okay? now. These three traits tend to get lumped together. X-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, and holes. And the, reasons I, or the reason I lump those together is because you can identify these three options or these three traits depending on what zeroes out, okay? So if you have a rational function, it's imperative that you set both the numerator and denominator equal to zero. All right, once you've determined the values of X that zero out your numerator and denominator, you can qualify those zeros into one of three traits. All right, so after you get your list of these numbers zeroed out my numerator, these numbers zeroed out my denominator, all of those zeros are either gonna turn into x-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, or holes. All right, so case one, your numerator and only your numerator is zero for a certain x value. If that's the case, then your graph has an x-intercept and you're gonna give me the ordered pair x and y, right, x comma zero. There's gonna be the second case that we've talked about where your denominator and only your denominator zeroes out for a certain x value. When that's the case, your graph is going to have a vertical asymptote and you're gonna write the equation of that line in the form of x equaling a number, okay? So when only your numerator zeroes out, x-intercept. When only your denominator zeroes out, vertical asymptote. And let me scooch this up because here comes the third case, the one that I haven't officially talked to you about yet but is coming. There will be a third case when both your numerator and denominator are zero out for a certain x value. When that happens, your graph has a hole. 
sometimes we refer to that as a removable discontinuity. But if it's a whole, it's still a point on your graph. All right, and you're gonna write the ordered pair with the x and y coordinate. All right, and I would just want you to take note, no x value can double up on traits. So what I mean by that is if you discover that you have an x-intercept at two, you can't also tell me there's a hole at two. It's one or the other. So when you start to figure out what numbers you had to boot from your domain and what zeroes out your numerator, if you got x equaling five, for example, five is either an x-intercept, a vertical asymptote, or a hole. It can't be more than one of these. So you've got to qualify it into one of these three cases. All right. With the end behavior, that's the other one that has a bunch of options. Let me scooch this up so we can take a look. All right, so with end behavior, we have four cases, and we've talked about three of them. All right, when it comes to determining the end behavior of a rational function, it's all about the relationship of the degrees of the lead terms in your numerator and denominator. If the degree in your numerator is less than the degree in the, your denominator, we've talked about how you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. If the degree in your numerator is equal to the degree in your denominator, then you have a horizontal asymptote at y equaling some number, and that number is the ratio of the lead coefficients from the numerator and denominator. If the degree of your numerator is exactly one higher than the degree of your denominator, then you have a slant asymptote, y equaling mx plus b, and you're gonna use polynomial long division to find that equation. And here's the fourth case. If, your degree in the, if the degree in your numerator is more than one higher, than the degree in your denominator, then there are arrows for the end behavior. And the direction of those arrows is the same as the ratio for the lead terms from the numerator and denominator. And, and let me give you a for example, just so you can see what this would look like. Let's say, and I'm just making this up, you had something like x to the fifth plus two x minus one over x cubed plus two x squared plus seven. Let's say you had something like that. And let me make sure that we can see that denominator. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so I want you to see here that the degree in the numerator is five and the degree in the denominator is three. So this is more than one higher than the degree in the denominator, right? It's actually two higher. So if you took a look at this ratio, all right, we would basically say, well, y is basically behaving like the ratio of the lead terms, which is x squared. So then my end behavior would be both arrows up because that's how x squared behaves. All right. So that's how you can get arrows potentially in a rational function when the degree in the numerator is more than one higher and you, you have to kind of circle back to those arrows we talked about for polynomials. All right, so with that, I'm gonna show you two basic functions that are rational, and then we're gonna start graphing. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye. Hey, Math 31, before we start graphing rational functions, I want us to just get some of our toolkit functions under our belt. So we've talked about the reciprocal function before. It is one of your toolkit functions. But now that we're in the section where we're graphing rational functions, it's a good idea to look at it again. So if I was gonna take a look at this function, the first thing I would wanna note was the domain. And again, I can't have a fraction where the denominator is zero and x zeroes out at zero. So I would say, well, I have to boot zero from my domain and you see that here, right? Where this sentence says the domain and range of this function is all real numbers except zero. All right, and because zero zeroes out, x equals zero zeroes out just my denominator, I have a vertical asymptote there, right? So the y-axis becomes my vertical asymptote. Well, let's address this next part. Why is the range all real numbers except zero? Well, that goes back to how we addressed end behavior. If we take a look at the degree in my numerator, it's zero, and the degree in my denominator is one, and whenever the degree in your numerator is less than the degree in your denominator, you have a horizontal asymptote at y equaling zero. And because I have that horizontal asymptote at zero, that's why zero is also booted from the range. So I can't plug in zero and I can't get zero back out. That's why my domain and range are both all real numbers except zero. And here's my graph, right? You see the vertical axis, excuse me, you see the vertical asymptote on the y-axis and you see the horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. All right, so domain, negative infinity to zero, zero to infinity, range, negative infinity to zero, zero to infinity. Okay, 
Let me scooch this up and show you the square of the reciprocal function. It's another good one to just check out. It's one of our toolkits. All right, so this has the same issue in that the domain is all real numbers except zero because if, again, if I wanted to set my denominator to zero, I would get x equaling zero. So x would equal the plus or minus square root of zero, but that's just zero. So that's why I gave zero the boot. Okay, but my range is going to change because you have squared numbers here on, on your function, so I'm not going to get any negative numbers. Everything that was below the x-axis in that reciprocal function is gonna get reflected and squared up onto the x-axis. So I still have a vertical asymptote at x equaling zero and a horizontal asymptote at y equaling zero, but because everything's squared, you can see that my range has changed for this, right? So I have a range of zero to positive infinity. All right, so with that, we're gonna stare down five examples, or four examples where we graph rational functions and then one that I'll call the backwards problem. So, so get ready, bring your A game. This is, this is gonna be pretty intricate, all right? I'll see you on the flip, okay? Take care, bye.